Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Latter-day Disciples podcast. I am so grateful to welcome today as my guest, Julie Clough. Julie is a keynote speaker, author, and international grief coach, and the host of the Build a Life After Loss podcast. She loves inspiring audiences with heartfelt stories to overcome the challenges they face and build a life they love. Her book, Miracles in the Darkness, Building a Life After Loss, encourages readers to look for miracles in their life despite hard times. Her online educational grief support group, The True Hope Club, is a place of love and light. She hopes that her experiences with overcoming devastating losses can bring reassurance to others. Julie enthusiastically shares a message of hope across many platforms, including the stage, podcasts, national radio, and television. She and her husband, Ron, live south of Salt Lake City with their golden doodle, Coco. They have six (laughs) beautiful children, including two angels and 10 incredible grandchildren. Julie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And I'm going to have to update that in a few months because we're we're going to have, we're expecting our 11th. It's oh. a lot easier to expect 11th grandchild than a, a child. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else gets to do the work. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Less of a, less of an immediate burden. <laughs> for exactly. sure. For, That's yeah. exciting. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank so you. I wanted to open up today, you know, and it mentions it a little bit in your biography. Um, but I think our audience would really love to hear your story and your background and what put you on the path of becoming a grief counselor. Yeah. Yeah. And, and well, so I, it's funny. I, I'm laughing because I was, in, I was interviewed by a podcaster who's a, a therapist and he's like, I imagine that when you were a little girl, you didn't say, when I grow up, I'm going to be a grief coach. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that certainly was, was not my plan for years, but uh, mostly I was just trying to get through my own challenges. I, I lost my brother to suicide when I was, um, when he was just before he turned 23 and I was uh, 27 And then shortly after that, my first marriage ended and I went through a divorce and I had three small children and and that was certainly a challenge. And, you know, each of these experiences, I'm sure there's people listening that have gone through divorce or have been, their life has been touched by suicide. And every, even though, you know, we use these terms and it, it sounds like it's the same loss, it's never the same loss. We all experience our losses as individuals and have individual experiences. Um, and then I remarried and we had three, three more children. So we were raising a family of six and, and having a crazy time and a, a fun time. And, and then um, on Mother's Day, in 2007, I was traveling across the country with my three youngest children and, and we were in a rollover uh, accident. And my two youngest who were, um, David was eight at the time and Carrie was 10. And they unfortunately were thrown from the car and they didn't survive. And every horror that you can imagine of losing two kids and being responsible because you were the driver of the car and all of the things it was, um, it was an excruciatingly painful experience, excruciatingly painful. And, um, my appreciation for the gospel and the things that I knew were true, um, grew tremendously during that time, even though, it didn't take the pain away immediately. Um, I had to go through that experience, but, um, yeah, I'm, you know, and then you mentioned like, what brought me to this place of being a grief coach? And that, that is that I, I had some experiences. I had some miraculous experiences in my healing process. And, and I tell that story in my book. Um, but, about five years after the accident, I, I had this experience where somebody said, you're supposed to do something with, with this. And it was like lightning hit in that moment. And I knew in my heart that I was supposed to do something with this, but I had no idea what that looked like. I was still trying to figure out 
what my life looked like, even at that point, even though I felt like I was, I was doing well and I was solid and I had, had overcome my PTSD and I'd overcome my grief and, and I was, you know, solid in my life. I was like, I don't, I don't know what to do with that. Like, what do you do with that? So it took me a while. It took me a few years to kind of come to an understanding. And I had other additional experiences that confirmed I was supposed to do something with this. And so, um, I, I discovered life coaching and I thought, okay, I can be a coach that helps people rebuild their life after everything has fallen apart, because that was my experience. I'd been homeschooling my kids when my kids died and all the things that I had thought might, I wanted in my future no longer made sense. And so I, I not only was having to, to deal with the grief and the pain. And when I, when I got through that, it was like, what do I do with my life now? Mm -hmm. So I thought that's what I would be doing was helping people figure out. And it pretty quickly, I realized I needed to get into the grief space. I needed to understand grief because the people that I was talking to, yes, they wanted to rebuild their life, but they were still carrying this heavy load of grief. And until they could put that down, the rebuilding was not going to, was not going to stick. It wasn't going to be easy. Mm -hmm. And then from, so from there then, is that when you decided to go to further your education and really dig into the grief space? What did that look like? Yeah. So I, I just started studying. Oh, so here's an interesting thing that happened at one point I thought, okay, I'm going to go back to school and I'm going to get my therapy degree and I'm going to get my therapy license and I'm going to become a therapist. And I enrolled in school, total intentions to do that. And my first week in class, it was like, God top tapped me on the shoulder and like, you're not in the right place. This is not what you're supposed to be doing. And, and, you know, I've met other people who were going into the coaching space and they got tapped on the shoulder and said, no, you're supposed to go into the therapy space. I don't know why that happens, but for whatever reason, <laughs> it was not, that was not where I was supposed to be. And so I, um, I unenrolled there and I thought, okay, well now what, you know, but I, I did, I just immersed myself in learning as much as I could about grief and, and took some certification classes and, um, did a lot of training and then through my own experience and, and the experience of multiple different types of training, I developed my own um, grief program and I developed my own model of healing. So I call it the hope model of healing. And so I have, you know, very specific steps that, that we have to, that we have to integrate. And, and, and those steps are foundations of growth. We don't, we don't move through the challenges of our life without growth. We can't just sit there and expect the healing to come. And, and unfortunately people are told, you know, time heals all wounds. We hear that. Right. And it doesn't, it doesn't. And so people are understandably frustrated because they're waiting around for the magic to happen and the magic doesn't happen. And then they're like, oh, there must be something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that they're carrying this burden and they, they, haven't found the steps. They don't, they don't know the steps and that's okay. Like it's something that, that gets to be learned. Yeah. I find your story so touching for a couple of reasons. First off, you know, the challenges that you've gone through are varied. They're all very intense um, in their own unique ways. I think that the loss of a child is universally understood to be one of the most challenging things that anyone can endure, you know, your own sickness and, and burdens and pain is, is one thing, but having a child go through that or losing a child, it's, I think we all can agree that that's just the hardest thing you can imagine, but I'd love to know a little bit more about like your personal healing journey, because I can see, I see the pain and the struggle that you had. And I love that, like you've taken it and you've found a way to minister to others 
through it, but what was it like for you? Like, how was the discovery process of you figuring out, I have this immense burden of grief from these traumatic events in my life that I've been carrying, because even that alone, I feel like requires a bit of an awakening. You know, we get so used to just doing life when it's so hard that we, we sometimes don't even realize that we are carrying around this weight that is, um, that is making us ineffective essentially in the other parts of our life. So tell me a little bit about what woke you up and, and the vulnerability and the humility and the process that you got to, to get help first. Yeah. I love that question. Um, it's interesting because through my, through losing my brother and I'd had other losses, I, I had some pretty interesting health challenges when I was in college and, um, and some other challenges that, that I don't typically share because it's not my, my story to share, you know? And so it is, but it isn't right. And, um, so anyway, I, when my kids died, I had a really, uh, in that moment, it was, it was, it was horrendous. And in the beginning, I I had so much grace for myself because I had experienced grief before. And specifically, I remember losing my brother and feeling like, how do you, how do you smile again? How do you laugh again without feeling like you're betraying that love that you have for your brother? You know, how do you move on? Even after my divorce, I remarried. And even in the first year of my marriage, I felt guilty for being happy. And I think that's such a common experience in our, I know it is because I hear it from my clients all the time. It's a common experience to feel guilty when we do have those moments of happiness through our grief. But it was easy for me early on to have a lot of self-compassion for myself because I was because I understood grief at least this much to understand it's hard. And of course I feel bad. And of course I feel terrible. And of course, all I want to do is lay in bed. And, um, and there was so much Hmm. self-hatred, so much self-hatred because I was driving the car. And so I had to learn to forgive myself and I had to learn to, to function in my life. And, And like I said, in the beginning, I was like, okay, of course I feel terrible. And somehow I'm going to get through this because somehow I got through these other things and this is harder, but if I could get through that, I can get through this. So I had this hope, um, that, that was just inborn in me. And I, and I know that's, that's, that's God, right? That's, that's the atonement of Jesus Christ that gives us that hope. And so I had the hope, but then as time went on and I wasn't getting better and it was getting harder instead of easier, I, I really started to, it got worse instead of better. And at about the three year mark, I was in a really terrible place. I was in a really terrible place. And I just, um, I, I just could not see my way out. I thought that, that my only option was to do away with myself, which was not an option. And it's, it was just like, you're, it's like being in your own jail. You know, it's like, there's, there was no relief. It was re- relentless. And, um, and that's when I was, and I, but during this time, during this time, I put so much effort into healing. I went to therapy. I had PTSD from the accident. I went to therapy and I got help for my PTSD. I, um, I engaged in my, um, in my neighborhood. I re-engaged in hobbies. I, I went back to playing tennis on my tennis, tennis team. I, so I wasn't just sitting around waiting for things to happen. I was trying a lot of different things, but over time I started going, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm broken 
and there's nothing I can do. And um, so interestingly, they, at the two and a half year mark, they asked me to be the young women's president in my ward. And my, this, the beehives were my daughter's friends. And um, I accepted the calling and I went into that calling and I did, you know, I got in there and started doing the work like I always had in the past. And I'd been in leadership before, and this wasn't, you know, something totally new to me, but two months in, we had a new beginnings program. And at that new beginnings program, I realized I was the only woman in the room that didn't have a daughter there. We, we, one of the things that we did at the end was we gave a rose to each of the moms, the daughters did. And I sat there and I thought, my daughter's not here and all of her friends are here and they're all giving roses to their mom. And it was kind of a breaking point for me. And I just really went into this dark place and I was pretty non-functioning at that point. And even though everything looked okay on the outside and and I told my bishop, I said, I need to be released. I just need to be released. I can't do this. And he said, no, you're supposed to be there. In fact, when he called me, he wrote me a letter and he said, I understand how hard this is. Even one of my daughter's friends who was sitting in the congregation when they sustained me turned to her mom and said, isn't that too hard? This is a 13 year old. Like what insight to even comprehend that? I, I can't even imagine being able to comprehend that. And it was, it was too hard and it just kind of put me under. And, um, and then on just before Mother's Day, right around Mother's Day at the three year anniversary of the accident, um, my bishop called me and he says, I need, I need to give you a blessing. And he gave me a blessing and the lights went on. And I felt that heavy burden, that darkness lift. And I was, I received the miracle that I wanted. And, and as I started this, this path of like understanding I was supposed to do something with this. And, and I appreciate being able to tell this story because typically I'm not speaking to an audience that would understand these things. And, and even when I wrote my book, I wrote it in a way like I tell, I can't tell, I can't not tell those parts of the story, but I wrote it in a way that it would be accessible to people that wouldn't understand our faith. Um, but yeah, it just, the lights went on. And then as I started to understand that, you know, I'm still here for a reason. I was in that rollover accident too. I, and I had minor injuries for, for being in a rollover accident and I just knew that I was here for a reason and that I was supposed to do something. But then I kept questioning myself. I'm like, how do I teach people about grief and healing? Because I can't say to them, you're going to have this miracle. And it was when I was writing my book and I was actually already doing the work of, of grief and, and um, recovery and healing and so forth. It was when I was writing my book and I was writing my story that I knew that I had been given that blessing so that I would have a testimony of healing, that it didn't have to happen the way that I experienced it. But because I had that experience, I have such a solid, strong testimony of healing and it can come in different ways. And I've watched it with my clients. I've watched the lights go on. And, and we all know that that's the power of Jesus Christ and that we all have access to that, no matter our faith background. And so I'm, I'm really grateful, beyond grateful for the experiences that I've had and that I can tell people, I can look them in the eye and say, you can heal from grief because people will tell them you have to carry it the rest of your life. And it's not true. It is not a truth. And it is a well-worn miss. Well, let's just call it a lie. It's a well-worn lie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Gosh, you're, you're so right. And, you know, for me, just that last part, where you, what you were saying about how there's this very popular lie where people are told that they have to bear their grief for the rest of their lives. And it just, um, I think for me, it illustrates the depth of the wealth of knowledge that we are given through scripture, mm -hmm. because really it's scriptural that we know that that's not true. Why is that not true? Because Christ has borne our griefs mm -hmm. because he has borne our griefs. We don't have to carry that load. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously it does take a period of time and on some level for everyone, I think healing is a miracle. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, it makes me so grateful and I, and I hope that we can all cultivate the tendency to run common common sayings or common beliefs like that through the filter of scriptural and prophetic truth. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think too many times, um, we take temporal knowledge at its, you know, for what it is, um, instead of questioning it and how important is that? Because what you're doing in that situation is you are giving someone hope, um, uh, rather than, um, condemning them to a hopeless situation by saying, you're going to have to deal with this for the rest of your life. It's just not true. And I think that hope is the word that kept coming to me, just listening to your story. Um, you know, even the beginning of having had trials earlier on in your life and being delivered from the pain that you felt after them and how that propelled you in the future when you had this monumental trial, this loss of your children, that you were able to reflect and say, I can get through this because I've gotten through other hard, hard things. Um, and, and in an instance, those, those previous trials were setting you up with the seeds of hope for a future trial. And then now being able to take those experiences and turn it around so that you can bless other people with hope. I just find that so inspiring and so very Christ-like of you. Well, and it's when you were saying that I'm reminded of the story of David and, and his, um, his success over Goliath. And, and he says, I fought the bear and the lion. So, you know, I, I've had these experiences. The Lord blessed me here. I can do this. And, and I think that remembering is such an important um, concept, such an important principle that we, that we learn in our scriptures. Remember, remember. And, and over and over again, the, the, um, the people of God were reminded to remember the, the way that the, their ancestors had been preserved or remember the blessings of God or remember, remember, it's just, it's throughout. And, and I think it's, it's a truly important principle when we're going through difficulty because the pain of our difficulty and the grief of our difficulty can numb our emotions. It can numb our senses and make it harder for us to feel God in the way that we have felt the spirit in the past. And in those moments, we, we get to remember, and that's what, that's what brought me through was when I was in the middle of all this pain, I just remembered, I remembered that the miracles that God had, had um, performed in my life previously, and that helped me to keep my faith, even in those times when I felt like, because what had happened and what so often happens is, you know, the devil gets involved when we're down the devil gets involved and he's like, Oh, this is perfect ground for me. I can get in there and I can tell people that, you know, time heals all wounds and there must be something wrong with them if they're not healed or, or you have to carry this forever because if you carry it forever, then I'm leaving this dark space in you that, you know, you, you're, you're not going to believe in, um, you're not accessing the power of, of Christ. If you believe that, that, uh, you have to carry it forever. So, remembering was key for me was even though in those 
times when it was difficult, I couldn't, I couldn't feel the spirit in the same way that I felt it before I could remember, but there was a twisted thing that happened, especially when things got really hard. And and those last few months before I experienced the miracle of healing, um, I started to believe, and I think I had believed it to a certain extent all along, but then it just got, kind of became reinforced in my brain that somehow all of this was God punishing me, that somehow I had done something wrong and he was punishing me. He had punished me by taking my kids away. He'd punished me by making me so miserable. He had punished me by me being the one that was driving the car that, you know, I just, I felt like God was punishing me. And I had a friend, uh, we were, like I said, I was young women's president. We were at a girl's camp and this friend of mine was the camp camp director and we were hiking. And I, I, at this point, I was so desperate, Megan, that I was just crying out for someone to help me. And I was, I didn't know how to ask for help. I felt like I had done everything. I'd done the therapy. I'd done activity. I tried to re-engage. I'd done all these things. I've read everything in sight, trying to find answers. And I remember sharing with this friend, we had, the girls were hiking and they were in front and I was, my friend and I were behind them. And I said, and I said to her, I just said, I feel like God's punishing me. And she said to me, the only thing God does is bless you. That is his, that is his desire is to bless you. And when she said that, like the truth penetrated and I knew there was truth there and it kind of like started to disperse the darkness a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it was just three or four weeks later that I really received the miracle of having that darkness lifted. That's so powerful. And that's, that's such a true, um, lesser known doctrine, I think is that, yeah, I don't believe in a God who punishes. I believe in a God who is unfailingly true and unfailingly faithful and unfailingly loving And sometimes the loving looks like tough love a Mm -hmm. little bit. And, you know, he is perfectly respectful of our agency. And that means sometimes there are, there are consequences (laughs) that are not fun Mm -hmm. to deal with. Um, But the idea of a God who purposefully inflicts um, hardship on us, I just don't believe that. I, I know that he allows hardship. I know that it's part of the design of mortality, um, is that we come here, you know, in, in, uh, pursuit of godliness, you know, this is a part of the process of godliness, um, is to feel and endure and overcome pain. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine, any beings who have felt more pain than our heavenly parents. Right. But what do we know about them? We know that they have a fullness of joy as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I think that that's something that we all could stand to better study and comprehend is, is that truth that God does not punish us. God only blesses us. That's, Mm -hmm. that's the only thing. Yeah. Well, and I think when we look at when we look at how we came to this earth, that it was our agency that brought us to this earth. So, so if God was a, a God that inflicted pain and punishment on us, he wouldn't need us to choose in and use our agency to come here. He would just be like, no, nope, you're going, right. <laughs> We're kicking you out the door. You're going, we don't care what you think we're here because we chose to be here. Mm -hmm. It was agency that created the fall, right? It was, we we're here because we chose to be here because we understood that this is what we needed in order to become more like 
our heavenly father, our heavenly mother, Mm -hmm. we wanted what they had. And this was the path to do that. And, and when we're, when we feel like we're being punished by God, you know, like, like I did, we're, we're really just feeling the effects of justice in our own choices. We're feeling the effects of justice because he is a just God. So there are, there are parameters to our existence. There are parameters. He's going to, he wants to give us as much good as he can, but we have to choose into it. Mm -hmm. And when we choose things that are contrary to eternal law, we are hitting justice. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, you know, it's like, you can't, you can't put your hand on a hot stove without getting burned. And it's just the same way. You can't, break eternal laws without hitting justice without that burn Mm. but he's a merciful god that provides commandments to keep us safe provides roadmap to to help us along the way angels the spirit he gives us everything to be successful yeah And, and 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 i look at my own life And I look at the challenges that I've experienced and I don't feel like God has punished me. I feel like he has blessed me immensely because he's brought me, he carried me through all of that. Mm -hmm. He was there and he carried me through all of it. And, and even when I didn't know that I was being carried through, Mm -hmm. I can look back and see I was carried through. I had experiences before the kids died that prepared me. Now I could never be fully prepared, but looking back, I can see these experiences that I had looking back. This is really fascinating. I'm kind of, I'm kind of an over, over analyzer thinker. I I think deeply about things. (laughs) Me too. Welcome to it. (laughs) But I can look back and I can see that everything that I needed to overcome the challenge of my kids dying and, and leaving this earth before me, they're exactly where they're supposed to be. I know that for a fact now. And that's why I have, I have so much happiness and joy here because, because I understand that I understand they're exactly where they're supposed to be. I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. Do I like the way it happened? No. But it's the way it was like, at one point, God said to me, like, literally, I heard these words in my, in my mind, like three months after the accident, when I was kind of complaining in my brain, like, why did this happen? And, and, you know, I kind of got this answer. Well, they're exactly where they're supposed to be. And I was like, why did it have to happen like like that? And the, the answer was, how would you have liked it to happen? And there is no good answer for that. Mm -mm. There's no good answer for that. But when I look back, I can see that I had everything in the moment of that accident. I had everything in that moment I needed to heal. I just needed to be able to embrace it. I needed to be able to um, grow to the point that I could understand the truths that I was given in the beginning that I needed to be able to assimilate that and to, to grow into the place that, that I could um, feel it and, and believe it and understand it and live with it. Wow. Yeah. When, when we were talking about, you know, God punishing the thought that came to my mind was if he was trying to punish his children, he's doing a really bad job (laughs) because he has given us everything. Yeah. He sent his son to bear our griefs and carry our sorrows with us so that we would never be alone in our pain, even in the moments when it's so dark and you feel like no one else can understand. Somebody else understands. Christ paid the price for our sins, that justice side that you were talking about it. And he paid the price so that we can overcome death and illness and sadness Um, you know, when it would have been everlasting otherwise, and what greater mercy is there 
than to know that our families are eternal, that there is life after death, and that your children belong to you, mm -hmm. regardless of where they are. Like, I can't think of anything more comforting than that knowledge that we've yeah. been blessed with. And so, yeah. And then, and then hearing it straight from you too, not only, you know, on, on a broad, you know, human scale has God given us these resources through his son, Jesus Christ and the atonement that he performed on our behalf, but to you individually, he was training you. He was rearing you. He was laying the foundation so that when the time came, you would have the resources and the skills that you need to endure the pain and eventually to find healing. Like, yeah. That's amazing to me. It is. And, and when I had that, the realization that, that Carrie and David were, that this was always their path, that, that they were not meant to be here longer than eight years and 10 years. And when I realized that, I thought, okay, so I basically had a choice. I could be their mother and have them for only eight and 10 years, or I could not be their mother. And I would choose being their mother every day of the week, every day of the week. And so, and they are very much a part of the work that I do. There's no doubt in my mind that they're very much a part of the work that I do, as is my brother. My brother is really close in this work. Hmm. Yeah, it's almost like their journey was that they agreed to minister with you, mm -hmm. but in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And both directions, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I agreed to, to minister with them. They agreed to minister with me that, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. The knowledge of pre-mortality. I just, the more that I think about it, the more I just realize how absolutely vital it is to know, you know, not only that Adam and Eve use their agency to fall in the garden, but they use their agency to choose to be the first man and woman there's no way I would have chosen that. You know what I mean? And like, we, I mean, we talked about this briefly before about how God, um, you know, he gives us our agency and he allowed us to choose to come here. And I think they did that on purpose because they knew we were going to point fingers at them <laughs> and say, this is all your fault. You sent us here. Um, but just, you know, the power of the thought that your kids agreed to live a shortened life. And the sacrifice that came with that, you know, like they knew, well, I, I have to believe that they had some degree of understanding, not complete, obviously, but they knew that they were going to be missing out on things. Yeah. Like they knew that they wouldn't have all of the experiences that so many of us get to enjoy growing up in a family and learning and, um, you know, developing eventually, you know, getting married and having your own family and the things, the ways that they could have served the Lord, you know, they must have known, um, but they were willing to sacrifice that. Um, and they chose a path, your path is just, their path is just different. It's just different. It's not better or more or, or good or bad. It's just different. And, um, then, and, and we don't, and I feel like we just don't comprehend why we have the experiences that we have and how intertwined it is and, and how much, you know, if we, if, if God honors our agency, which he, we know he does, then I have to believe he honored our agency in the preexistence too. Like, there's no question that that was part of the, and, and I think that we, we come down here knowing our, our soul knows what, what the design is of our life, even if, even though we can't remember and that veil is there and we, we don't have the remembrance, but we know, we know. And it's, it's, um, when the month before they died, it, we had some really unusual circumstances. Our, in our ward, we had three people that were, were dealing with kind of end-stage cancer. 
and um and one gentleman died and then this young mom died and she had been she'd been diagnosed with cancer and she um then found out she was pregnant and decided to carry the baby and delivered the baby and then died and um and that was just I think it was less than a month before the accident when Carrie and David died. And I, I had some really powerful experiences during that time. And it was, and I felt like sadness. I felt this, and it wasn't, it wasn't just what was happening. It just felt like greater than that. And I didn't understand it. And I didn't know where it was coming from. And I kind of thought, well, maybe it was the anniversary of my brother's death that was kind of stirring that up, but it was different than what I experienced in previous years. And now I see it as pre-grief. It's, and I've, I've met a lot of friends and I've met clients that have experienced this sadness before something happens mm. because our soul knows. Mm. So fascinating. Yeah, that is so interesting. And something that I've never thought about or experienced personally, but that makes a lot of sense because mm-hmm. you're right. You know, I, I believe, um, I believe in the doctrine of common consent, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, when we sustain, you know, various leaders in the church by raising our hand and saying, yes, we agree to, you know, support them. And so because of that, I believe that something to that effect existed pre-mortally and that we had to agree to the things that we were going to experience. Couldn't have understood them right on, on an emotional or mental or physical level at all. Um, but our spirits agreed and, you know, became acquainted with what our lives were going to look with, look like, and then agreed. I don't have a quote to back this up. So this is doctrine, according to Megan. Um, <laughs> but it, it really resonates with me. And I'm afraid that <laughs> I might be a little bit more cautious now when I'm having a blue day. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't, th- I don't think we're meant to be like you know, freaked out, and, and yeah, because if we think about fear and faith, and mm-hmm. we want to stay in that place of faith, and and um, and certainly I understand that because with all of the challenges of my life, I've spent some time in that space of what's next, you know, mm-hmm. and and then I just like you know what, I don't know what's next, but I'm going to enjoy today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to love today. I'm going to, to live the, you know, everything out of this day. Mm, I love it. Okay. I want to turn just really quickly. I know we probably only have a few minutes left, but, um, you know, one of the reasons that I really wanted to talk to you is that from the perspective of what I call the lateness of the hour, Um, you know, we're, we're very much in the last days. I was impressed by how many, um, signs of the times and things were quoted in general conference just at the beginning of this month. Um, but you know, I've, I've been thinking about men's hearts failing them. And I think there are so many different meanings that we can attribute to that, but it's clear to me that more than one sign of the times, um, signs of the time seem to point to a more universal and broad, um, perhaps, uh, experience of individual grief, uh, which I think makes total sense considering the other signs of the times that we know, you know, the, the various challenges that there are. And so from your perspective, I'd love to hear you know, are you already seeing any trends when it comes to this area of there being more people experiencing grief or deeper levels of grief? And then also what tools do we have? Are there tools available to us that could somehow mentally, spiritually, emotionally prepare us to better bear that burden, knowing that it's likely that we might face that in the future? Yeah. Well, I, as you were saying that, I was like thinking of a few different things. First of all, I will say that the whole COVID experience was a community grief experience. 
everybody experienced grief at some level because grief is not about just about death or divorce. Those are kind of the top two that people think of in terms of um, grief is about loss. And when we experience loss of any kind, that brings feelings of grief. And so I really felt that community grief on such a soul level, especially at the beginning when I had to, I had to kind of work through that for myself too, because I'm so entrenched in this, in this space that when all that was happening, I could just feel, I could just feel the heaviness of it and on so many different levels. And so it's, you know, first of all, it's, it's, being able to acknowledge that we're grieving and giving ourselves the space for grief. Uh, you know, Elder um, uh, Uchtdorf gave, I can't remember the name of the, the conference talk, but he gave a beautiful address. And I don't know if you remember where he talking about flying mm -hmm. and he says, you know, yeah, Young pilots think when you hit turbulence, or you might think as a passenger when you hit turbulence, that you speed up to get through it. But he says, in fact, you slow down. So he gave this, this whole thing about when we hit rough patches, it is necessary for us to slow down. We do that when we injure ourselves physically. And for whatever reason, when we experience emotional pain, we resist that idea and we get, we get this idea that we're supposed to stay busy and distracted so we don't address our pain, but, but honor the pain, honor the grief, be in it, experience it and allow it to move through. I, I'm fascinated by the way that we handle emotions. Emotions, if you think about it, emotions are energy in motion. It's supposed to move through us. And we don't stay at an elevated place of, you know, this euphoric happiness and joy. And we're not meant to stay in this bottomless pit of despair. We, we as humans are expected and to experience this range of emotions. Mm -hmm. And so um, if we, if we fight against the grief, and I think a lot of people are burying their sadness because they're ashamed of it, which just adds another dimension. That's what puts us in despair is the, is the shame. We bury the grief because if we believe that we have to carry it, then we're going to shove it down and bury it. Because if I've got to carry it, I'm not going to show it because I just need to show up and look like I'm okay. But what if we honor our grief? What if we say, yeah, this is painful. This is really hard. What if we're honest with ourselves and others? But the, the, thing, the thing that allows us to be honest about it is to, is to be able to know that we're going to be okay. It's like, yeah, this is hard. In this moment, this is hard, but I'm going to be okay. On the other end, everything's going to work out okay. And it, in being in that space of trust that we are supported and loved and that our heavenly father has put in place resources for us. We're supposed to help each other. We're supposed to learn from each other. We, when we hurt, when we break our leg, we slow down and we go see somebody that can help us. We don't sit in our house and pretend like we're not hurt and pray that heavenly father will save us. No, we get the help we need. We ask for his help and he directs us and sends us to the people that can help us. So uh, there should never be any shame in getting the help that we need, whatever that looks like. There should never be any shame in feeling grief and feeling pain. We, we should honor that pain and know that I think it's interesting. I was just reflecting on this recently. You know, it says in the scriptures, mourn with those that mourn. It doesn't say those people that are mourning shouldn't be mourning. It says mourn with those that mourn. It says be there for them. 
we're here for each other. When we go through pain, like, like I've experienced this and I feel compelled. It is a mission. It is literally my mission to share a message of hope, to share the model of healing, to help people see that there are steps that we can take because we've been told just wait around and it's going to happen. And there's even a thing, I don't know if you've heard of this, but there's a thing called um, that they've labeled post-traumatic growth. Have you heard of that? Hmm. So, so there's, there's this label because they've, they've identified that there's a, there's a certain percentage of people who go through difficulty and instead of it crushing them, they experience what they call post-traumatic growth. But there's a sense, as I read through the literature on this, there's a sense that post-traumatic growth is just by accident Mm. that like you either grow or you just kind of drop into this grief that you're going to have to stick with the rest of your life. And my philosophy is, is that we can get involved and we can choose into post-traumatic growth. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So anyway, I could go on and on, as you can tell, I have a podcast. I have like 155 episodes. So, you know, I have a lot to say. <laughs> I love it. I a lot, a lot, it's a lot, so a lot relevant. to say. Well, like I said, I feel like it's one of the most relevant topics because um, grief is a part of mortality. And I was thinking about this even before you went into the post-traumatic growth um, and what that means. But I was thinking about the nature of grief and and the whole process of grief, even what we were talking about, about there being pre-grief and then, you know, the experience of loss. And after that, you know, there's a period of denial, anger, shame, hurt, pain that can be completely debilitating. And then having a realization of, you know, there is hope, there is purpose, there's a reason, um, and, you know, using the atonement throughout this entire process. And I was thinking about how grief may be from my perspective, one of the very few things that really gives you the opportunity to grow in almost every Christ-like quality that I can think of. Like, what experiences are there that give you a better opportunity to exercise faith or to reflect on your life and make positive changes through repentance or to exhibit courage? You know, I was thinking about how much bravery it takes to lean in um, to those emotions that you don't want to feel, um, and, and, you know, to feel them anyway, and to reach out to someone else and to be vulnerable and to ask for help. And then to kneel at the foot of someone else's cross, even when you're in pain, like there is so much courage that is required in this process. Um, you know, everything, I just think about the humility, the compassion, the unity that we could experience as humankind through suffering. Like it really is. I, I feel like a way to, in an expedited fashion, um, just access Christ and become more like him. Yeah. Well, and yeah, because when you think about it, when something really difficult happens, it's, it, it just kind of takes away our, our existence. Like it, it takes away what our foundation, it like everything we thought was, was true about our life. Everything that I thought was true about my life just kind of went away in that moment. Like what I, how I identified myself what I thought about the gospel, what I thought about pre-existence, what I thought about death, what I thought about life after everything had to be re-examined. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. It's an opportunity for us to let go of the things that are not truth and to, to really dive in because we, we, because we have a desire to really understand these things at a totally different level. 
Mm. and dive in and find the truth. Mm. So good. So powerful. Well, we're about out of time. It's been about an hour. I, I want to be respectful of that. But um, as we close, I think the last question that I would ask you um, is just what would you say to someone who is struggling and perhaps doesn't see an end in sight right now, um, even if they logically know you know, that there is hope. Um, what, what would you say to that person? I think that as much as we can remember the times in the past where we've been supported, supported by the spirit, supported by miracles, um, that that can help us to carry through. Uh, I think that understanding hope, that the faith, hope, and charity, I feel like hope is the piece that we haven't really understood. And true hope, because we, we kind of use that word like wishing. I hope this happens. And that's not the true definition of hope. Hope is knowing that something is going to happen that hasn't happened yet. And it's different than faith. And, and so it's, I kind of look at it as when we put a, an address in the GPS, we're exercising hope that we're going to get there. Like every night when we go to bed, we're exercising hope that the sun's going to come up the next day. Like those are all experiences of hope. So our hope is in Christ. And, and one of the, I was going to mention, there's a, an article or the conference talk by Elder Scott, Richard G. Scott. Mm-hmm. I believe the name of it is To Be Healed. And I came across this talk. It's from like 10, 12 years ago, uh, not too long ago. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is all the things that the Spirit's been teaching me that I've been kind of implementing as I teach people. And here it is in one article. (laughs) I'm like, wow, this is like confirmation that I'm on the right track, (laughs) but it, it is hard. And so I think that having those examples and I, I, I teach my clients a lot of times, I'll say, if you don't to, to build your hope, if you, if you just, if you just say to yourself, well, if, Julie can do it. Maybe, maybe I can too. And open up that space for hope, you know, find that, that, that little, you know, keep that flame alive and continue to, um, to feed that flame of hope. Mm. I love that finding the flame of hope. And I, I was thinking too, you know, you, you gave the example of hope, you know, we always think and reflect on the sun rising. We know that the sun is going to rise every day. And, you know, I think more importantly, we should have a testimony and exercise faith in the truth that the sun is going to rise every day in our life. And he doesn't let us down. Yeah. He's never sure. let, he's never let anyone down who has relied on him. Yeah. Hope is the most important thing because if we have hope, we continue to look forward. We continue to look toward the horizon. We continue to move towards Jesus Christ. If we let go of hope, there's no reason to move forward. There's no, nothing. We're not, we don't have a direction Mm -hmm. and hope is, is crucial. Yeah. I think that this is a really good key to me too. And something that, um, I love to focus on in our study of the last days, because it gets so easy to get caught up in all of the terrible, (laughs) all of the, all of the awful things. But if anyone has gotten anything out of this podcast, um, 
I hope that it is. I hope <laughs> I um, I really do though. I truly hope that it is the fact that there are great things in store yeah. for us. Yeah. And the key is relying on the sun. It is relying on Jesus Christ. And this is just another application of that truth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Julie. This has been such a pleasure for me. I'm so grateful to learn from your story and, and again, from your light and the hope that you have found in your life and that you continue to share with others. Um, we're so grateful. Thank you. Thank you.